Optimus Bet. Welcome back to a non-holiday edition of Is It Pagan? <laughs> it was only a matter of time before we started hitting right. things that weren't holiday-centric. I mean, it, yeah, it's a non-holiday, but it is still answering the Is It Pagan question just in a little bit of a different way. So, Joe and I are together again because, you know, why wouldn't we be at this point? Um and we are going to address some, not concerns, misconceptions, maybe would be the better word, for what both of us kind of, where both of us kind of sit when we start talking about harmatology and sin. The, there is some misconceptions about what we believe and what we think about it and what we think about other people with it and all this other stuff. So we're just going to lay it all out now. And re we're doing it as an is it pagan because unfortunately the, the misconceptions on all sides is that anybody that doesn't say things the right way is coming from a paganist mindset. Or an agnostic mindset, or an atheist mindset, or whatever. And so that's what we're going to deal with today, is that. Right. But before we get there, we're going to let Joe, because he says it better than I do. We're going to yes. let Joe kind of explain what the misconception is as far as what people think that we are saying regarding all this stuff, as opposed to what we actually are going to say for the rest of this episode. Yeah, so... Um... This was kind of brought directly to the surface when uh, this past uh, two weeks ago now, um, I did a live stream with our with our our brothers in the network um, on on accountability and what it means to call out sin and all of that kind of stuff. And I said to uh, I said to Aunt before we even went live, I was like, dude. I'm get, it's going to come across like pe people are going to think like I'm soft on sin. When you start to hear me talk about it in relation to the way that you guys talk about it or the average person talks about it, it's, it's going to happen. I'm telling you right now, I'm going to be the odd man out because it happens almost consistently. Every time that sin comes up or discipline comes up or what it means to treat somebody as an unbeliever or what it means to um, where, where we draw the line on on partnering with people who are in sin or any of the adjacent conversations. And so in a nutshell, in the West, when you come to the topic of sin and issues like that and how we as Christians should operate around those. And you don't come hard, hardcore leading with your big stick that says like, this is the truth. And if you do not fall in line with this truth, I'm going to hit you with this big stick. Um, then you come across as soft. And you come across as somebody who is complacent or or willing to overlook sin in order to, um, you know, get somebody into the club, so to speak, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and it creates this it creates this weird barrier where nothing else about what about about why it's coming across like that. Nothing else about your actual position gets processed. All just that you aren't saying the things that check the immediate boxes of what culture mm -hmm. dictates you should say as somebody who is, you know, plays by a different playbook or, or, or identifies as a Christian or something along those lines. Well, more, we want, I want to actually pull one thing out you just said here, because part of what you just said there is what culture is telling you to say is sinful. Yeah. When we say that, this is the this is one of the things that makes it kind of ironic when we, we start going through this, is that 
one of the things that we get accused of occasionally is that, well, we are just caving to the culture and not calling something sin. Yeah. But yeah. part of what we are going to start breaking down here is what we are actually saying is that the, the, the theological culture of this sect of Christianity specifically that normally gets mad at us, which is not just evangelicalism. It's not just fundamentalism. It is a, it's not even necessarily just an American. It is a specific style of Western theology that doesn't even have necessarily a, a label that is easy to put on it. But it's one that we addressed when Joe was on Misfits a couple weeks ago and we were talking about fear as well. Yeah. Because it is a culture, it is a theological culture that is almost more fear-driven than it is love-driven or Christocentric-driven or kingdom-driven or anything else. One and of so, the one of the paradigm shifts, real quick, but because because I, I, you 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 hit it, but I want I want to kind of clear away the brush a little bit for the for the listeners. Um, the the longer that you spend teaching the Bible or theology, studying history, the Bible, theology, biblical canon, all of these things. And you see the historical uh, elements of how humans have interacted with this concept of religion, this idea of we worship a God who sent his son, who paid a sacrifice for us, and, and all of that, and how all of that shakes out, you realize that there are some through lines that encompass multiple groups of people. Some mm -hmm. things that we talk about, some things that we have talked about at at nauseum um, with, with just the times that I've been on, let alone with any of the other rotating voices, that you can say it's this group – it's this group that identifies this way. It's this period of time. It's you, you can pinpoint it a lot easier. This is something different because it 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 tickles the brain of the human. It's pervasive specifically because of human nature. We mm -hmm. talked about the last time that I was on, and don't get it twisted, guys. I'm on here again because I'm still campaigning to get myself on the logo. Um, so, so hashtag put Bluebeard on the logo. I'm just saying. Um, so, so when when I was on the last time, we talked about fear based theology. We started getting into that topic, and when you start talking about things that are that are innate to the human humans in general wrestle with fear uh -huh. humans in general wrestle with what they do not understand or what they do not see humans in general wrestle with their own survival instincts and when uh -huh. i say survival instincts i mean you are coming against me because you have a different thought process or you're doing something different or you're acting in a way that i deem inappropriate and out of my survival out of the survival of my way of life out of the survival of my moralistic structure i'm going to come against what it is that you are doing and in our world in the world of christianity the direct path is to call that sin. Now, yeah. I understand exactly what I just did in the last five minutes. I threw a lot of people under the bus. I don't mean to because I have I, – Andrew can sit here and tell you at, for the next hour all of the ways that in our working together over the last two, two and a half years, I have changed – in how I've approached others, uh -huh. how I've approached playing in the sandbox, how I've approached being able to cooperate with the saints, understand that there's a plurality of expressions of worship, understanding that that sin in relation to God, in relation to all of this stuff, is all like it, it's so much more complex than just sitting there from my perch saying, I believe this. And if you do not believe like I believe, then then get away from me, you heathen. 
You know what I mean? So so this is this is an, an inclusive conversation, not us sniping at the, our brothers and, and sisters. And that's exactly why we're doing this is because part of what this little intro thing is saying is that these are the conversations that we normally get thrown into yeah. as far as where we are the ones being sniped at. We're doing this conversation to say we don't need to be sniping at each other. Right. Because part of what we're going to get to is that the, like Joe said, the culture, the theological culture that this conversation comes out of is the one that is causing there to be the divisions and the fear and everything else. Yeah. And if we can get past that and actually look at what scripture is saying as far as how we as believers look at this idea of what sin is then we don't we won't be sniping at each other anymore instead it's going to be a place where we can all now fellowship together actually yeah so we're going to start by Joe I you're lucky my buzzer is not charged cuz I'm going to quiz you a little bit now so we need to actually define terms here a little bit so I want to start by asking you when when people have to ask you to define sin how would you define it? What is it that you're talking about when you define sin? Missing the mark. No, I'm playing. Um, I mean, yes, but I wanted to give the the canned uh, cliche answer. Um, so, so it's a it is it is a breaking of the law. Now, from that point, we need, we need to. There's way more definition, but at its core, before you go into what law means and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's, a, it's a breaking of the law. Now, what does that look like? The law was given as a code of conduct, as, as best practices, as a way of life that, that brings about life, the way that we are called to live. Now, the whole gimmick behind the law is that no person can actually live up to the law and thus the whole idea behind Jesus. Now I'm 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 expecting that if you are listening to this, you likely are are understanding and following my shorthand. If you are not, you can shoot me an email at joe at buddywalkwithjesus.com and we can have a conversation and we can explain these things in in way more in way more long form if it's something that that you don't understand the jumps that I'm making but I'm going to keep shorthanding for now um when 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 we break the law we prioritize our will over God's will and thus choose a way of life that ultimately does not bring about life because it's not God's it's not it's not God's will thus the the verses that we have about sin leading to death and all of that he used the cliche one at the beginning which we'll get back to in a minute but you know I like I like the the last little bit especially the way that you you laid it out is the idea of the fact that sin is anything that is going to to prevent life from happening yeah. in the most spiritual sense yeah. in many ways in a physical sense also, which we'll get to in a little bit, but yeah. a, it's a, it's a wanting there to be life because if we believe that Jesus is the life, life happening would be Jesus. And so that's a good thing. Typically the reason that we hear the cliche argument is because that's more of what it means from a Jewish perspective is you are missing the mark. You have violated God's law. The problem though, is that when we are talking about it from a perspective of Judaism compared to a perspective of mostly reformed Western Christianity, the idea of missing the mark is missed. And that's where if my, thing was working i would be able to throw the you know the hi-hat in but it, it's missed because the idea of missing the mark within judaism is exactly what joe already said is that the expectation is that you are not going to be able to actually do everything that the law tells you to do it is impossible to do this and so you are going to miss the mark 
And so when you sin, you then now need to go about doing what is needed to get yourself pure again. This is part of what we've been talking about on Kingdom on the Road, currently as we've been walking through Leviticus, is what all these different things mean on Fridays. So, but the other in, thing that's missed when we start talking Judaism is that not all of the laws and not all of the sins are looked at in the same way. Mm-hmm. Because if you are, need to violate the Sabbath law in order to save someone's life, not saving the life is actually considered a more grievous sin than violating the Sabbath oppression of other people even in the name of religious purity is a violation of a grave a, a greater sin but that's not necessarily how we talk about it when we talk about missing the mark from a western christianity perspective where we talk about well you missed the mark and so that means that now you are a sinner and you deserve damnation, and so God's going to come get you unless you do exactly what I say now. Right. And that's easier to reconcile for the human because of our our self-centered perspective of justice and vengeance and revenge and all of those kinds of things. So, so folks... I have been around enough. You guys have have listened to Andrew and I work together for long enough that you guys know that it is not an episode of Misfits, Is It Pagan, or any of the other projects that we work together on. (laughs) If we don't say, rest in the story, take in the whole story. So... You had drawn a distinction there that I think is very, very important um, to, to, to really show how all of these concepts that we've been talking about kind of interplay with, with each other. I don't know who needs to know this, and I don't know if anybody that does need to know this would be necessarily listening to us right now, but Christianity is intrinsically tied with Judaism. Yes, With the Jesus of it all, there is a separation. There is a divergence between between the two at some point in the theological uh, story. But when you look at the history of Christianity, you, you have to trace it back to the Jewish roots. And when you start to think about, okay, what about... What about this law? What about this one? What about that one? What 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 happens if somebody breaks the Sabbath? What happens if somebody um, doesn't? You know, I, what's the one that everybody goes to? Don't boil a, a a goat in its mother's milk or whatever, like stuff like that. Like, what what happens? And you, when you look at the law and you look at what. At its at its core fundamentals, what is God doing there? What is God um, establishing as a way of life for His people through the law? And then you take that forward and say, "What is Jesus teaching? What is Jesus establishing? What is Jesus contextualizing?" And you understand, well, wait a minute. There's a continuity, and there's a reason why. Jesus says, I did not come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. But you don't get there without understanding the Jewish roots Mm -hmm. of Christianity. You don't get there without understanding that there has to be a level of nuance when establishing all of these different um barometers and trying to put your trying to put your pins in these different in the, where you're going to set them in the different topics and things like that and an understanding that even even back into the pentateuch even even that far back you had folks that were not genealogically 
descended from Abraham choosing to be a part yeah. of God's chosen people. That is why in Exodus, post-Egypt, you have this reaffirmation. It is essentially replaying the scene where God says, okay, now's the time where you choose. Now's the time where you say yes or no to whether or not you want to be my chosen people. And that point forward established a new covenant that that then came with the commandments, that came with the law, that came with the standards that were there to help build a nation, to help build from the ground up what life would look like for God's chosen people. But if you look at all of the through line, if you look at all of the continuity, you come up with two things. You come up with the fact that God, even playing field, image bearers. Mm -hmm. Two, you come up with the fact that God, God instituted a way of life. Now, mind you that there's, there's, there's wild differences between the Old Testament, the New Testament, even between specifically the time period of the Old Testament and the time period of the New Testament. We don't even need to compare against, compare against modern day. We can just compare <laughs> against those two time periods, that wild differences. But God established a baseline of, okay, this is what you got to do. But if you can't afford to do this, then do this. But if you can't afford to do that, then do that. And that's Making what... it accessible to everybody involved, thus establishing a baseline of reconciliation, a baseline of a reachable means of repentance before you even get to the Jesus of it all, before you even get to the Holy Spirit of it all, this is already baked into the character and heart of God. And that, you notice how we're still talking. We, we started this thing off. What are we talking about? We're talking about sin. There has to be, this, this is where already the conversation has a means of getting off the rails. When you are in the the seat of people like Andrew and I because we do things like read Matthew 18 we do things like uh th talk about sin or talk about how we cooperate with folks that do not live the same lifestyle that we do or do not do not adhere to the same uh, to the same um habits or or systems or whatever and and we talk about things like like, like reconciliation, like peace and love and things like that. Well, what about, what about what we have to do as, as, as Christians? What about treating people as if they're unbelievers, if they're not listening? You know, you know what I'm saying? You already have lost the people who are looking for the big stick because you're not leading with the big stick. Yeah. You know, the, you know, we'll 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 come back to that part of a minute because the the first thing that you you talked about was this idea of you know Imago Day level playing field, and this is part of what we talked about on Kingdom on the Road back the last time as we're recording this when I was on we were in uh, four through six of Leviticus, mm -hmm. because that's where God prescribes this is what you must do to offer up offerings to me, and one of the things that Aunt and I found as we were reading through it that we hadn't seen before was that the wording that that God uses to describe the people throughout this whole thing. Like Joe said, they have different, there, there are multiple options for sacrifice based off of what you are able to give, mm -hmm. which is awesome and is something we need to remember, especially those of us that are in leadership positions within our churches, that if you want to claim tithing is still a, a Christian principle, Go ahead, but then make sure you actually know what tithing is, which is another, you know, well, that's another, uh, we're going to have that conversation. Joe and I already are planning on having that conversation, just not today. Now, you the, just ran past that bees hot, that beehive, just kicked that thing and then just kept on running. Uh, yes. Okay, cool. Yes. And I kicked it in a very specific direction. Now, the, 
but the the other part that we saw there is that the way that it is worded when you look at the text, when you rest in the story, is that the name the the people that are coming with the offering are not labeled as the offender. They are not labeled as the sinner. They are not labeled as this person or that person are labeled by what they're presenting. Everybody, including the village leaders, including Moses, including Aaron, including the priests, include everybody that comes with an offering is blanket statement as they are the offerer. Yep. That's a huge deal. Or that is a huge, huge deal. It doesn't matter who you are. You are the offer because you are you are offering something up to God in order to be reconciled to him and to the community at large. Which is the other part of what we said at the beginning is that part of the issue we have is that the way that we look at sin comes from an individualistic mindset. Everything is based on the individual with the way that Christianity looks at sin. And that's partly because of the fact we understand that salvation is an individual act. Joe's faith will not save you. My faith won't save you. My faith doesn't save my kids. Joe's faith doesn't save his wife. It's an individual act. Mm -hmm. But the whole reason we're having this discussion is because like we said, this sprung out of another discussion on accountability because accountability is a necessary thing because it is about community, which is again, part of the Jewish understanding of sin and why miss the mark is a good explanation for it. Yeah. But when we divorce community away from this discussion and make it about individualism, suddenly miss the mark doesn't make any sense. And it's used instead as a way to typically raise us up on the playing field rather than level the playing field so that everybody is there in front of a holy God. Let me let me tweak what you said just a little bit. If you are keeping to the accurate definition of missing the mark then suddenly it doesn't make sense because and i make that distinction because we see plenty of examples of malform definitions created to fit exactly the scenario that you are talking about and that's why that's why we keep going back to the old testament of it all the jewish uh, history of, of it all because without understanding why the law was established, how the law displays the entire, not just not just the, the righteous, not just the holy, not just the 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 justice fueled aspects of God, but the entire heart of God. If you miss that, then you have missed part of what jesus teaches and and part of what so so i want to speak to um folks that are of a particular vintage because i would guess that there is at least some some level of this representation within the audience um maybe you grew up in a situation where um you were a part of a youth group and and you did something wrong or you know you saw somebody do something wrong and they were carted in front of the youth group or carted in front of the church and and it's this idea of you have sinned you have affected the community and thus now you need to be brought in front of the community in order to uh make right for for what you did or or some some variant thereof um that is in no way shape or form what we are talking about right that that's something entirely different from this whole individualistic versus community-based thought process, because even if you are being brought in front of other people, it is still an individualistic 
perspective is still based out of you have polluted the waters, you risk destroying the ecosystem here, and thus you need to be brought in front of everybody to tell what you have done. It is this whole idea of public ministry, public uh, 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 bu public uh, bloodletting. Um, it, it, it's it, it's in, in a lot of different versions thereof. It's it's still rooted in fear and control and anger and all of those kinds of things that are more human elements than they are elements of um, the fruit of the spirit or, or driven by mm -hmm. Holy Spirit or, or with a desire for reconciliation and peace and all of that. But unfortunately, institutionalized, we are now at a point where there is a generation of us that are standing in opposition. I'm not saying that we're the first. I'm not saying any of that. But by and large, there is a generational shift taking place that we kind of I, I, I really want to believe, and maybe this is some of my my rare optimism coming out, that that <laughs> our generation uh, cracked the door open and the generation that's coming behind us is kicking that thing wide open and not taking anything that that is being shoved down their throat, that we have been institutionalized to to think that. We need to run around calling out the sin in other people and calling people unbelievers if they don't change into what we think they should change into. Run, uh, run with our convictions and things like that. And there's, there's a huge – that is an aspect of the modern climate that we still see very, very prevalent. And, and I think sometimes – I think sometimes th there are folks that want to believe that when we describe some of the ways of the modern element that, oh yeah, that was how Puritans acted, right? That was mm -hmm. how, that was how, that was how the ancient, the, 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 you know, the far back, you know, they were the ones that were burning people at the stake. They were, they're the ones that were doing all that kind of stuff. But yeah, we might not, we may have laws to protect against burning people at the stake nowadays, but at an emotional level, at a spiritual level, at a heart level, are are we really trying to reconcile people from God or or to, to God, or or are we trying to protect the ecosystem from the godless heathens? Mm -hmm. I think the the slip of the tongue you had there, I think, actually was correct. Is that we are trying to reconcile people away from God? Yeah. You know, this is what, so those of you that um, may have seen it, we released a blog a few weeks ago dealing with the idea of the fact that we, it seems like we have misunderstood three things. Misunderstood who Jesus is, misunderstood what Jesus as the Messiah actually means, and what both of those have to do with how we view the role of Scripture. And this is exactly, and it was based out of Isaiah chapter 2 and Micah 4, which both say the exact same thing with like one word changed. And it's the prophecy about how the Messiah, when he comes, will turn your swords into plowshares. Yeah. And the entire point was that the Messiah, when he comes, will make war irrelevant. Yeah. Because he will arbitrate peace between everyone because mm -hmm. everyone will be at peace with him mm -hmm. and when they're at peace with him there will be no more conflict between anyone else right and part of what we put out in that blog though is the fact that what we are seeing as far as what is being defined as far as what what the secular culture views the bible or even views christians using the bible as is that they are wielding the sword of the spirit as a weapon of war rather than as a sword that has been made into a plow 
to get the fields ready for the harvest that Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 9. Mm -hmm. Because it we is... look at, we're looking at things as an us versus them. This is the same conversation we've had multiple other times. That a lot of times when we get into the sin conversation or even the how we are supposed to treat unbelievers out of Matthew 18 or all these other things, it is an us versus them category that completely breaks away from the fact that if we believe that Jesus is the one that reconciled us to God, hmm. why do we continue to act as if our job is to keep other people from reconciling both with us and with our God as well? Right. So I'm going to, I'm going to go to Paul for a second. Paul makes a lot of analogies about sports about training, about athleticism and things like that. Now, unfortunately, in the wrong hands, that's where you get the get the the groundwork for a lot of the games of Camus Mus Macho that happen between Christian men. That in order to be a, a, a real Christian man, that, that you got to be an athlete and you got to be strong and you got to go to the gym all the time and all this kind of stuff. That that you and and that dubs it dovetails into all of these different side things. Put away childish things, and you know all of this kind of stuff. But in in saying what I've just said, I can't ignore what Paul said. That Paul used those analogies, and he did so for at for, for a reason. Now. And if you I'm want to learn how to use them right, csrm.org. Beautiful. Um, cheap plug. You even do it on your own show. That was impressive that you even found a cheap plug on your own show. Um, so so there's this th there's there's this uh, mentality that has to take place when you are an athlete. And I'm not going to tell you for exactly how long that I've been an athlete because I don't want to ad ad admit to my vintage. Um, but but I have been an athlete since I was 16 in some form or fashion. And there's a mentality thing that that takes place. Mm -hmm. um, I was I was forced into um, early retirement from. Um, the from the 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 one form of athletics that I was doing because of an because of an injury, um, and I couldn't accept it. The reptilian part of my brain just would not. It would not. It kept asking the question: What if I did it? What What if we did it one more time? I thought I had run one more run left left in me. All of this kind of stuff, and and so I started, you know, seeing doctors and so on and so forth. But it's that part of your brain that kicks in whenever you're training that says. I don't care whether or not I want to or not. I know I need to. Mm -hmm. I know that if this is something that I believe in, if this is something that I want to see start to take shape in my life, then I need to train my body into submission. I have been very vocal about the fact that I think running is of the devil. I think it is pagan. Running is pagan. TLDR, running is pagan. But I do it because it's just, it's, it's, it's good. Like I, I need to do it. I hate doing it, but I, but I, but I train myself on how to do it. Um, that's when, when we look at the way that Paul conceived of it, I would argue that Peter and Paul are two of the guys that show us in the most plain text within the biblical canon of how to adopt high theology and these deep resonant practices into the everyday life, yeah. into just, the, just, just some person and how they can internalize these things and take these principles and things like that. But part of understanding how you get there is understanding the full breadth of what you're doing, understanding the full breadth of who Jesus is, understanding the full breadth of what it means for Jesus to be the Messiah. In all of those things that you were describing, it, there is a reliance on understanding the context of 
those concepts, of those principles, different things like that. And, and that's what the, you know, what the, the things you were describing, the most explicit example, and this is part of why those, are, again, CSRM, what we use a lot of, is one of the most explicit examples of proper sports ministry imagery out of the Bible is out of 1 Corinthians 9, which is Paul. Where he lists boxing, he lists running, and he lists all these things as far as how to compete well. And how that applies to discipleship. Hmm. But the bigger thing is that that is at the end of a much bigger portion, which actually we were eventually going to get to anyway. Because in 1 Corinthians, Paul actually lays out how we should actually be having this conversation about sin. As far as what it means for us as believers, both from a personal standpoint and a community standpoint and a external community standpoint, as far as evangelism and disciple making, and as far as reconciliation and relationships and everything else. Because if you look at 1 Corinthians 6, all the way up to the end of 9, you see exactly what we have been talking about. The idea of what accountability looks like for the church and what accountability looks like as far as how do we go about living in a pagan society. It talks about how to have community as a church while also still having community with those outside of it. Mm-hmm. And the big piece out of 1 Corinthians 6, and this is where we're going to actually start talking the concepts a little bit more. Because we've given very concrete or even sometimes not unconcrete definitions of sin. Mm -hmm. But I think we need to actually dive into what the concept of sin actually is as far as what it is that we see Jesus actually rescuing us from. Is what we see in 1 Corinthians 6, where Paul says everything is permissible. Yeah. But not everything is advantageous. That is actually what a post-cross view of sin should actually be looking like. Because if everything is not permissible, your saint sin still has its power. Yep. Plain and simple. This is part of, again, why we are saying the fact that what this really shows a lot of the times is where the base of your theology at is at. Is it still of fear of sin and death and Satan? Mm -hmm. Or is it in a trusting that I have been reconciled to the creator that created a perfect world and is now inviting me back into it? Which one of these things are we actually at? Go ahead. And, And that's baked into that is this idea of the 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 present and the not yet Mm -hmm. the the present kingdom and the kingdom not yet come um when when you realize the level of interaction that we get to have in the current with god before Everything, all separation, every single form of separation is gone. And the taste of that that we get here, that that changes everything. Mm -hmm. See, here's the thing. And and this is probably one of the more um, fascinating things that I see as far as guys like us. Um, What we we have to contend with. Um, one of the things, like, like I said, we get told we're soft on sin, right? We're, we're, we're theologically liberal and all of this kind of stuff. Well, if you actually sat down and had an in-depth conversation with Andrew and I about all of those key topics that people would associate with whether that, that distinguish whether or not you're theologically conservative or theologically liberal, Many of those things you will find that theologically are pretty conservative. It's it's things that center around stances. 
it's things that center around prioritizing one version of sin or one version of of taking your will away from away from God's will that those are the things that we don't agree with culture on and thus those are the things that tend to get us labeled mm -hmm. as being theologically liberal and and when you look at this idea of being like being righteous right and that and this this whole idea of of doing the things that you know you should be doing there's a reason why humans struggle with that because humans try to do it of their own power of their own mm -hmm. volition of their own desire now mind you humans are terrible at that in no uncertain terms humans are terrible at sticking to actual conviction Hence, the whole idea behind the indwelling of Holy Spirit. But the, the, the problem is, is in order to get to the stuff that actually matters, the stuff that mm -hmm. actually shapes and forms theology, shapes and forms relationships, shapes and forms your context within community and all of that kind of stuff, then, then we have to make room for being able to go there. But the problem is, is your stances, your opinions, they block that runway. They make it so that way you cannot actually get there and you cannot actually investigate truth. I'm not even saying lay down your thought, mode, of, mode of thought for my mode of thought. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, if you are authentically seeking truth, the truth of all of this, then, then you need to lay your preconceived notions on the table. Some of them you may pick back up. There are some preconceived notions that you have that weren't incorrect. Maybe they need to be tweaked or formed. We all need that. But there may be some thoughts that you have that you're like, oh, okay, I've thought, I've thought through this thing, I've processed through this thing, and yeah, okay, some of this stuff needs to stay and and like go like go away, and some of this stuff needs to needs to be picked back up, and and I'm good, you know, you know. So so it's not all a complete and total 180. You need to, but most of the time, humans being given to nonsense on the reg. We, we, we generally need to discard more than we keep. When yep. I look at the entire breadth of the theological shifts that have happened in my life over the last six years, oh, I can count on one hand how many have stayed, how many I, I feel like I walked in with and a broken watch is right twice a day. You know what I mean? Every once in a while, blind squirrel finds a nut sort of thing. You know, you, you can, you, you, you find these things like, Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, cool. I happen to have the right idea about, uh, about that thing, but how that's contextualized and the, the, the larger picture that that's contextualized into changed widespread, wide, mm -hmm. wide, wide, widespread difference. And, and, I say all of that to say, come, come join the party. Like we're not trying to, again, we're not trying to, to condemn you. If you are somebody who says, ah, I re need, to, I need to rethink this. I think we all need to understand that we need to rethink this. And then when we make a shift, probably need to retool and things like that, because there are, especially for those of you guys that are given to social media and all of that, understand that when you are reading somebody's Twitter post, when you are reading somebody's somebody, somebody who's particularly hardcore or particularly definitive or something like that, yo, that probably came from something. Somebody got hurt somewhere. Somebody they love got hurt somewhere, church abuse, 
physical abuse, spiritual abuse, so on, so forth, so on. There are things that led to, okay, I've seen how bad this is. I've figured out this thing over here. So now I'm going to jump right over into this thing. I did it with Jesus versus religion. There's a whole spoken word piece about Jesus versus religion. Mm -hmm. And dude, I was bought in, sold out. I like, I love that thing because I found it in the midst of 2020. I found it in the midst of the American Christian church falling directly on its face the the i found it at exactly the right time i was pissed off at the world i hated everybody and i said what i said i i mean i i had a level of hatred in my heart for other christians because of what i was seeing and so to hear that was like somebody like saying like oh finally Finally, somebody understands and can put lyrics to how I'm feeling and things like that. And yeah, I'm I'm still uh, in a lot of ways uh, one of the more anti-establishment folks that you're going to find here. The running joke, and it's not really a joke, is that Andrew keeps me around because I look dude. I make dude look like a moderate. You know what I mean? Like that. I, I'm I understand that I am not sure on opinions and I am not sure on passion, but that idea of Jesus versus religion, that idea of how do we cooperate, that idea of what does it mean to actually love others, love God and all of that kind of stuff has to also be taken with nuance. And that's that's why we kind of backdoored into whether or not this thing's pagan. Well, it's not whether or not sin is pagan. It's whether or not loving your neighbor mm -hmm. is pagan. Loving the unbeliever is pagan. Using other people's pronouns is pagan. Having women in leadership is pagan. Whether or not the, the this whole idea of kicking people out of the church because they don't conform to your your mode of life is pagan. The the thing that drives me nuts about the whole thing is there are many aspects of this. I'll go back to and I and I'll I'll, I'll tip my hand right out on the right out on the table. I keep going back to the youth group thing because I watched it. <laughs> it didn't happen to me, but I did watch a young lady who got pregnant, be carted in front of everybody the, the twice, once at the youth group, once at the church, like mm -hmm. the church wide, carted in front of everybody. And this is this is where this is how they sinned, and this is how it affected the 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 the. the and and that idea of your sin can affect the community is very very real and that's why we are given a context of how to address that but within that context we go back to the idea of what is your motivating factor? What yeah. is, is it, is it love and communication and reconciliation or is it, I've got to, I am called to be God's sheriff here on earth. And I'm going to run around with my six shooter and say, if you don't conform, I'll say it like this and run around saying conform or die. Yep. And, you know, the the key thing that you identified is actually what we need to end with as far as how we actually go about practicing this sort of thing. Is that the, the key to everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial is recognizing that the spirit is the one that makes the determination, not us. Yep. And that's in terms of for the community and for us as individuals, the spirit is the one that makes the determination and not us. Right. And this is part of why this goes back to the renewing of the mind sort of thing is that in order to get to that point of being able to recognize that fact, we have to be humble enough to allow the spirit to do it. Like Joe said, there are things that he has laid down that the spirit then told him to pick back up. But there are other things that he laid back down and he's not touched again. Not because he necessarily was in the wrong for having those opinions or anything like that, but because the spirit has shown him that 
those are not beneficial. They're not beneficial to him. They're not beneficial to the community. They're not beneficial to the kingdom. Leave them aside. And that may look different for different people. Yeah. You know, this is part of where the discussion, you know, part, part of the discussion that comes up, especially around the idea of homosexuality and everything else. The assumption is that homosexuality is just a blanket thing. And that since it's a blanket thing, this is where the pronouns thing and everything else comes in. Anything that Christians deal with it at all have to be complete rejection or you are, you are, or you are now in sin yourself. But yet we ignore Christians that are also homosexual that are showing the fruits of the Spirit. Yep. Why are we now denying... Now, why are we now denying the fruits of the Spirit in other people and in doing so, not showing the fruits of the Spirit in ourselves and then claiming that the sin is coming from this label rather than a denial of yeah. the fruit of the Spirit or the submitting of ourselves so that we do not ourselves give in to the spirits of the flesh? Yeah. So what is it that is beneficial? Things. What is it that is harmful? There are two things that I that that I think are very pertinent to to bring up here. The first is you had mentioned things that I've that I've I've set down and and some things that I have picked back up. Now some of those things that I picked back up needed to change. They st- even though I picked them back right. up, they still they they still needed to change. And I'm going to give an example. One of the tenants that made that that was so very very prevalent in the early days of of buddy walk in the early days of hearing me proto preach all of that kind of stuff um is this idea of osas and Mm -hmm. and i i've said this before uh, and i'll say it again for those of you that don't otherwise know um buddy walk with jesus the ministry has been around um we we were we were podcasting before podcasting became cool in twenty. Before you even get into that, define for those that don't know, OSAS is once saved, always saved. Yeah, yeah, I'm I, getting back. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm I was getting say, back there. that we need to define also. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hang on, hang on, hang on. Ashbed, Ashbed. Um, the so so uh, before it became what it is now. Um, buddy walk with Jesus was a two man show, uh, myself and a dude that I have to give credit to, um, it took a lot, it took a lot of punches from me. Um, but me questioning his, 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 his spirituality, questioning his faith, questioning Christianity, questioning everything. And he just heard it and he took it and he took it. And, and it was not, um, very it was it was very rarely respectful when i when when i did it but he just endured and so even though he and i don't really do business together anymore um i i got to give him a lot of credit for being willing to deal with me um and, and and all of that uh but but all of those early days that's all still out there for people to see because the the desire is that people can see that as a pastor now I, I came from someplace. Theologically, I came from someplace. I didn't just start off fully formed and all this thought and, and all this stuff. There was a lot of bad theology that needed to fall off along the way and get pruned and all of that kind of stuff. So all that stuff is still there for you to listen to. But OSAS, once saved, always saved, is this idea that once you, once you sit, you once you pray the prayer, you're good. You're done. That's it. Like there's nothing that you can do from that point forward to mess up your way out of salvation. And I, I, it was the only way that, that, that the idea of an all knowing creator God in this Jesus dude and, and all of this kind of stuff and all of the evil that I had seen in the world and all of that. Cause again, didn't grow up in church. I, I, I the way any of that could make sense was, was exactly through, through that and and to the point where um most uh people who would uh define in terms of isms would have called me an arminian uh or, or say that i was given to arminianism i don't 
I don't get, I'm not given to the isms. So I may have, I may have said that incorrectly, but whatever. Um, it, this idea of nothing sovereign, everything is free is, is nothing but, but free will that, uh, that whole thing. And, and that, idea of you can choose whatever you want and God still has you. Now I needed to lay that down because I needed to say, okay, so let's extrapolate out the thought process. If, if that's true, if I get to le live however I want and I'm still good, what does this mean in relation to this other concept of Christ as King mm -hmm. of Jesus being Lord of my life? Because I'm not, I have, I have a, I have a particular distaste, and I'm, and and I'll, and I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll keep it, I'll keep it at a, at a certain level when I say a particular distaste for the ritual of it all, for the routine of it all, for the altar call of it all. That's a conversation that we need to have. Is yeah, we will. Our, our we altar will. calls pagan. Um, yeah. But, but that idea of, of. Um, the ritual dictates I'm good and now I get to go forward however however I live now people ask me now do you still believe in once saved always saved and the answer is yes but it looks different mm -hmm. because if there is no distinction in who is lord over my life that's not an OSAS problem. That's not, that does, you're, you're talking about something that falls outside of the paradigm of once saved, always saved. And it's one of those topics that needs to, you need to take that out before you can, you can get down to the brass taxes of if I seek to live my life as a follower of Christ, all the while screwing things up from time to time, getting things wrong from time to time, putting my foot in my mouth from time to time, getting pissed off from time to time, all of this kind of stuff. And all the while, grace and mercy and love has me. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's that that's 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 starting to look a lot like a biblical thing and 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 not so much about some kind of denominational stance and and things like that. And so, yes, but like I said, different. Now, that brings me to number two. If we have set the parameters at you still have the opportunity to choose things that are separated from God's will, but grace and love and mercy have you because these are struggles that you are going through. These are struggles and temptations that you are faced with and all of that. It comes to this other, the, the, this other concept of us as Christians and how we view other people that are wrestling with these things. And this is the point where I need to put Andrew over because he gave me lyrics to something that um, it's just, you ever hear a thing and it's like, Oh yeah, that's a really simplistic way of saying it, but that's, that's, that's it. That, that hits, that hits the nail directly on the head. It's this idea of empathy shifts. We talk about theological shifts. We've talked about that today, but the other thing to take into consideration is empathy shifts. Now, mind you, I in no way, shape or form, I'm just going to rattle off a couple you know, things that I've needed to change, uh, change in my life. Uh, I don't, I don't think anybody will be surprised to know there is not an American flag to be found in this house. Uh, and, and, and there never will be, um, you know, things, things like, like, uh, I, 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 I grew up in a very militarized family. I grew up on the East coast where nationalism is the soup of the day and all of that. And so, uh, there was a point where I'm like, oh, everybody that wants to stand against Christian values, when I'm still wet behind the ears, guys, when I'm still like, like fresh out the gate trying to figure out what this whole Christianity thing thing looks like, I'm hearing culture, I'm hearing it's it's the height of woke becoming redefined into this thing that that is meant that is a catch all for anybody who doesn't believe in in conservative good Christian values and all this kind of stuff, and and this it's it's at the height and fever pitch 
of Trump mania and all of this kind of stuff. And so words like snowflake would, would be very readily used, right? The, the um, terms like the alphabet mafia Mm -hmm. would be readily used for me. And this is, this is where somebody can, sometimes you gotta admit to the fact that you're the jerk of the situation, right? Like, and, and, and for the actual bit that I didn't just do on this, watch some of my other shows that I'm not, I don't, you know, not holding my tongue for. Um, but, but sometimes you have to admit to how you've gotten things wrong. So I admit, I admit freely to the fact that I've said these things. And, and through exposure to the Holy Spirit, through exposure to my wife who taught me how to love and how to, and, and how to care for the, for the individual um, and, and, and all of that, I've, I've shifted into this. The, I, I gradually shifted away from singling these, these people out and saying, what does it mean to actually love people? Now, for as much mm-hmm. crap as I talk about 2020, it also was, okay, if I'm going to be about it, then I've got to do the thing, right? And and that means not holding people at, a, at an arm's length because they practice a particular lifestyle that I, uh, that I don't agree with. So what does that look like? And starting to develop, okay, and now, my, now suddenly this dude who used to be like, well, now about the whole, about the whole, you know, pronouns and, and, and God doesn't make mistakes and, and all this stuff. Now suddenly I've got members of the LGBTQ plus community on my couch looking for counsel from, from my wife and I, I've got folks within the house church that I help plant that identify as a a different gender than they were born as. And, and all, all of that stuff. And suddenly like it's, it's a whole world view lesson that I'm trying to like, like what, what, what are these terms and what is this and what is that? And I'm learning. And suddenly I realize if somebody says to me, I prefer that you use they, them, he, he, his, her, that, like, whatever. I prefer you use this pronoun versus that pronoun. I had to ask the question, okay, so if I do that, does that mean that I am somehow offending God? And then that got fuel on the fire when I, when I did, the, did the deep dive into what the, uh, into the word pornea specifically during my time during my time in Matthew and and Matthew 5 through 7 and that blew the doors wide open because guys let's be honest have we all always been willing to give over our cell phones to have somebody to take a look at our our uh, search history i'm just saying that that and the whole LGBTQ plus thing, if we're looking at this, I'm talking, I'm talking to you, conservative Christians. I'm talking to you guys that think that 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 that, that are that are standing on the shoulders of scripture that that are that that are saying, I want to keep this 100 when it comes to relation to scripture, then study that word. Study that word and understand everybody that Jesus is addressing in that moment and understand, oh, there's 52 flavors of nonsense. Always has been, always will be. There will always be like that when, when it comes to sin, it's Burger King up in here. You can have it your way. You seriously, just because somebody else's flavor of sin or desire or lifestyle or and I'm and I'm not I'm not just saying sin. I'm, just, I'm take these words like these are all the, these are all words that will that 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 apply to this situation, whatever that is. Just because somebody else's flavor of that looks different than your flavor of that, doesn't mean that there's a distinction of 
that's worse than yours. Because I'm going to say this and 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 get things spicy here for a second. If you are, and mind you, if you have little misfits running around that are within earshot and all of that kind of stuff, that's just, just fair warning. It'd be mini misfits. Mini misfits, whatever. Um, if if you look at heterosexual porn. It is no different than looking at homosexual porn. There is no difference. A, a manipulation of that mode of thought or that code of conduct or that way of being or that, that, that principle that's contained within scripture, a manipulation of it is a manipulation of it. It doesn't matter what, what flavor of manipulation it is. And, and so all the while, as these things are developing, and I'm realizing that, that yes, OSAS is real, but for an entirely different reason, and, and the reality of the continuity of God, and the reality of grace and love and mercy, and things like that, and this idea of God always being positioned for us for our best interest, even when we are, quote unquote, missing the mark, even the, even when we are um, messing things up, still being for us, then, then that, that empathetical shift takes place of viewing the person first and the activity second. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, I have walked with people in a relational context and had and have had to have awkward conversations, but that's out of a relational context. That's out of relationship. That's out of something that is caring and loving, not trying to point out the particular sin in a person's life. And that's, I think the... Another way of saying all of that would be if, you know, when you hold to OSAS, what is your focus? Yeah. Are you, are you grounding it out of a Romans eight idea of nothing can separate us? Or are you grounding it in a second Corinthians 12 of my grace is sufficient for you? Right. Both of those things are true. Both of those things are true. But if you are going to emphasize one over the other, which one is it? Is it that nothing can separate us from God because we're just good now? Or is it that God's grace is sufficient? Yeah. Which means that if me having to love someone makes people think that I now support something they see to be sinful, is God's grace sufficient? Right. Which one is it? Are we fearful of the way that the world is going to view us? Or are we saying that even if I fall trying to do what God has asked, God's grace is sufficient for me? Yeah. You know, th this is what the Jewish understanding of sin actually looks like out of the Old Testament. Is that if I have to violate the Sabbath in order to save someone's life, I will violate the Sabbath and I will do I will I will I will offer up my sacrifice later. If I have to violate the Sabbath in order to flee temptation, then I will offer up my sacrifice later. Because the the heart of the matter is what actually is at stake, which is what Jesus says in Matthew 5. You think murder is bad? Well, I'll tell you what. If you hate the person in your heart, you have already sinned against them. That is what, and that's what the law has always been when it has actually been understood in the context of what the Messiah was actually supposed to do. Right. And now we have, we've gone full, full circle within a lot of the way that Christianity talks about this stuff to where now we are saying that sin is this because we're not 100% sure whether or not Christ the Messiah actually did all of this has he actually died once for all sin so that all might be reconciled 
and his grace is sufficient for us so that now nothing can separate us? Or is it that we are now back to, if I don't do this, God is going to strike me down? Right. That is the problem we have with the way that we talk about sin oftentimes within a theological culture that is fear-driven and not Christocentric or kingdom-driven. That is where we are actually at. It's not about being soft on sin. It's about leaning into the grace of God and understanding that the Spirit is the one that convicts and draws people to Christ and is the one that that calls us to righteousness and renews our mind. It's not us. Our call is to love God and love other people. And by doing that, we will allow the spirit to convict those that he needs to convict. Yep. That's it. So this was a different version of visit pagan, (laughs) the non holiday special. Um, so if you want more of visit pagan, you can go to either the buddy walk or misfits channels. I think both on YouTube, I think both of us have playlists up for that. Um, there will be its own special page up once we get the network site up. This is just one of many network shows um, that have a variety of hosts. Some of the other collaborative ones, Friday mornings at 9.30 a.m. Eastern um, on all of the Misfits, all of the Buddy Walk, all of the um, some of the personal channels as well for me, Joe and Ant. You can catch us live Fridays walking through demystifying the Old Testament, doing some of the stuff we did today. Um, some of the stuff we already did, some of it we're, we're getting ready to do, um, as we're currently in Leviticus on Saturday mornings, you can catch more of Joe and aunt and pastor TC and Rico and occasionally Tiara and all sorts of other, other guests, um, let it rip walking through some different things Saturdays at nine 30 AM Eastern, um, live on all the same channels, um, Buddy Walk wise, he's still going through the Acts project. Uh, do you know where you're at currently? Uh, I just wrapped up chapter five. Just wrapped up chapter five, so he's he's working his way through it. Um, again, BuddyWalkWithJesus.com or any of the place, any all of the links can be found in Joe's on like everything. Um, you can also find out all the Misfits stuff, MinistryMisfits.com, um, all the normal links, all the normal good stuff there. Um, the Is It Pagan, I believe, does have a page up on the Misfits site already where you can catch all of our holiday specials and all of our other specials we do as well. Um, we do have the the Bible study still going on, Patreon.com backslash Misfits, walking through the book of Daniel. We're a few weeks behind, depending on when you're listening to this, um, due to some scheduling issues different things like that, internet problems, all that good stuff. But we will be finishing the book of Daniel here soon, hopefully. Um, Joe, you got anything else? Uh, No, I think you got it covered. Awesome. So, yeah, Misfits, we'll see you next week. Buddy Walk folks, we'll see you next week. Is it pagan people? You never know when we're going to show up. So we'll see you when we see you. The Ministry Misfits podcast is a production of Ministry Misfit Media in association with Overwhelming Victory. Dr. Greg Linville and Andrew Fouts are our executive producers, and Brandon Simmons is associate producer. The Ministry Misfits theme song is written and produced by J.D. Laird and Laird Creative Agency. If you would like to get in touch with us, you can email us at ministrymisfitmedia at gmail.com or by following at Ministry Misfit on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. You can also visit our website at www.ministrymisfits.com or through bio.link backslash Ministry Misfits. If you would like to support Ministry Misfits, you can become a patron by going to patreon.com backslash Ministry Misfits.